Welcome to the Feldenkrais Institute of New York. I'm Marek Wyszynski. I'm a co-founder of the Institute and a partner here. It's my honor and privilege to introduce this special person, David Weber, who is the creator of Seeing Clearly program. To me, who is one of the most authentic teachers one can find. So without any further delay, he will tell you about the story that brought him here. I don't want to hold you from that. Please welcome David Weber. Thanks, Merrick. You're welcome. Before we do anything, would you just please sit for a moment I'm not even before I welcome you. Sit for a moment and just consider quietly what is it that brought you here? In other words, what would make you happy by having attended this workshop? Not what I'm telling you you're going to learn, not what anybody else has said, but what is it that you would like to experience and would make you feel happy. And do not consider whether it's possible or not. What do you want? Don't judge it. Just take a moment and really ask that question. We have to know what we want in order to get it. And I want you to ask that of yourself. It's just a word, or a feeling, or a thought. Before the judge, the judger comes up and says, nah, you, you can't, nah, you can't have that. What is it that's before that? You might have an answer, or you might not. But just sit there and feel you're on the floor, and you're breathing, and there's some wish inside. Okay. That's enough of that. Now I'd like to welcome you here to the Feldenkrais Institute. I'm really looking forward to the weekend. I love doing this work. This is, this is when I feel most human. And I know that if there are 70 people in the room, there are 70 different reasons for people being in the room. The reasons are, go deep for everybody. They range from people with very significant disease to people who are teachers of the method or other modalities, healing modalities, who have perfectly good eyesight. And everything in between. So it means that some people are very fragile, feel very vulnerable to be here. It means that some people are experts in the method, let's say. So the question is, how can we all be together in a learning environment? We're creating a system like the brain, learning system that will be good for everybody and take everybody a little further along the line towards them becoming happy, which would mean, if you're a human, getting what you want. And I, I hope that this three days of exploration will take you further along that path. It's subtle work that we're doing with the eyes. 
I hope that you'll get some inkling of what that might mean. And nothing's obvious. With the eyes, nothing's obvious. So we're going to go slowly. I think I'll just get it out of the way at the beginning, which is a little bit of my personal story and how it is that I'm here and why that might turn out to be useful for you. About, actually precisely 20 years ago, I was working in the computer business and that, lear- that looked a lot different then than it looks now. I was in the part of that business called networking, which is a bit, it was obscure. Nobody networked anything because at that time all the computers were made to work separately. And some people had discovered in the prior years a bit that you could communicate from one personal computer to another using something we called modems. Don't use them anymore, I don't think. Now it's all part of the system. But anyway, I got involved with that part, selling hardware in that part of the business. And I, by 2000, no, 1995, the, the word internet didn't exist. And there were some businesses that were starting to network their computers. And that meant you had a bunch of individual desktop computers, and you might have three that you needed to hook up together, maybe the finance department with the secretaries. Remember secretaries? Something, cr- and the warehouse. Maybe somebody got a really smart idea. Well, if, the, if this damn company knew what it was doing, it would do better. So they started sending information between computers. And in particular, some really turned out prescient people started to realize that they could take the whole banking sector, which was all paper, and they could digitize it, and they could run the stock market that way, and they could run banks that way. Now there's a growth idea, as you've noticed. And at that time, people were starting to trade over this, over telephone wires. This is in the early 90s. And that's when I kind of got into that part of things. By fluke, just worked out that way. So I learned very early in the game about how networks worked. Systems, I was involved in the big systems. I was involved with AT&T, actually. Okay, let that go, and then I got sick. So it was a very uh, exciting time to be around this trade, and it was very, as you can imagine, horribly painful to lose my eyes, to the point where I had to stop work. Okay. I was really on my own for about five years in the medical system and it was terrible. I was on a lot of drugs, I was, had five surgeries, it was out of control, I lost everything that I knew of as who I was, uh, all my friends except close friends. And I was out of work. So I lost my livelihood, I lost my friends. Maybe some of you can relate to that kind of suffering. 
I went to the doctors, they did what they could. Turned out, they, in my case, they couldn't do anything. So I was in a situation where I had to figure out things for myself, to be honest with you. So I began to say, well, what are other alternatives are there in the world to deal with this inflammation that had grown to take over my eyes? Inflammation is simply an expression of the immune system that results in an overactivity of the defensive mechanism of the immune system. The simplest example is if you cut yourself, you heal. Generally, the skin will heal. Well, in, that, in this case, it affected my two eyes to the point where it just destroyed my, ravaged my eyes. And the doctors really had given up any kind of hope. I was taking a lot of drugs. It was terrible. And I, again, to make a long story short, I was doing my own research as best as I could in the state that I was in to see what else in the world can I do. I was following the medical world, Western medical world, and it's maybe a good time now to say that I am not a doctor, nor am I an alternative doctor. If you have a critical situation with your eyes, if your eyes are in crisis or acute disease, and there are people in this room I know of who are having a lot of diagnoses put on them and their eyes might be in danger, physical. The doctors know better. Don't ignore the doctors. In general, if they're competent, they know how to treat crises to get you out of crisis. And I did, and I'm thankful, even though there were lots of side effects and lots of problems, still, that enabled me to have a chance to change the ground rules that were underneath what was causing the problem. But I had to figure out what that meant. I had, when I was younger, studied Buddhist meditation before you could say that out loud, which was in the 70s, quite intensely, because I found meditation fascinating. Awareness, the whole process of, of awareness, which is, I had met as a 2,500-year tradition and was very interested in the implications of what trained mind can do when I was healthy and young. And then I got on with my, the busy activities of my life. I also studied, uh, I'll name it, the Bates Method, which was named after a New York City ophthalmologist at the turn of the 20th century, who had a radical idea. He was noticing that his patients, and he was very well known, he was a highly respected doctor, his patients were getting worse. Their eyes would get weaker. He'd give them glasses and they'd get worse. And he said, what, what's going on with that? So he did research into that and found out, to make a long story short, that the, the, the underlying the problem with all diseases and difficulties with vision is the fact that the eyes are very tense. The muscles of the eyes are habitually tense and only, he discovered, when that was able to shift would the whole scene change and the eyes could heal and get better. But unfortunately, as you know, in a bureaucratic world, he went against what was then becoming 
accepted as about when people come with uh, bad eyes, basically you do something to deal with the symptom, but what we don't, they weren't looking at and didn't want to look at what the root of the symptom might be. Mostly you can solve it with glasses. So glasses became accepted and what Bates was saying was not. Because it's a lot of work compared to giving a pair, a pair of glasses out. Right? They gave them glasses, he did not. He taught them how to relax their eyes. So I, he must have been a genius and I respect his abilities incomparably. But he was basically run out of town. Okay, I went to find myself a Bates teacher, and they took that teacher was highly respected. Took one look at me and said, "No, I, <laughs> you're too sick for me." So that was disappointing at that time. I'm not saying they would now or did others would, but that's what my experience was. And in my despair, I also went to one of my old meditation teachers who I knew of as being an expert, let's say, in all kinds of areas. And he said, well, I can, I can give you the four exercises that they used in ancient times in the monasteries because they had eyes then and they had problems with their eyes then too. And they knew there was a relationship between mind and vision and eyes and seeing and the senses. And he said, I'll give you those. So one of them was basically relax your eyes. And their approach was to relax your eyes, you have to relax your mind. And Bates also knew that too. But I was in such a terrible state that I couldn't move from being paralyzed by fear. That was my state. And he gave me an instruction that said, well, here's a certain color, turned out to be deep blue-black. And he said, meditate on that for three hours a day. I don't know how you're going to do it, but that was what the old practice was, because that's the only color that will totally and completely relax the muscles of the eyes. So that was another approach. Useless to me. Inspiring, but more than frustrating. So I had this information floating around in my mind, but I didn't have any practical way to do it. The doctors were giving me drugs like prednisone, in order to try and shut down the immune system response. It was an immune system response that was triggering all this overactivity. But that wasn't working either. My, my immune system was out of control. And then a friend of mine taught Feldenkrais and Marion Harris, whoever I'm to whom I'm forever thankful. She's a great teacher. She's in Toronto. And, and I went to her weekly classes, a couple times a week I went to classes, not for the expectation that it would help my eyes. I just went because I, there was something for me to do, roll around on the floor, and I, because I'd meditated when I was younger, I knew if I was going to survive whatever it was I was in, the best thing I could spend my time doing was practicing awareness, rolling on the floor, which was really all I knew how to do anymore anyway. So I thought, yeah, it's better for me to roll on the floor with, uh, with awareness than it is for me to try and well, that was my choice. I thought I'm going I was being told that you're, you're going to be blind. So what, what can a person who sees think they can do? So I started going to her, her classes, and it turned out a program, professional training program started in Toronto. I liked the work, so I took the, I took the training. 
And then in that training, I found some information from Feldenkrais that indicated to me that he knew something that nobody else had told me about that might be helpful. In that training, I learned that one way to think about the brain, not the only way, but one useful way to think about the brain is as a system. And it's not just the brain, but it's the nervous system is what permeates every and directs and controls the activity of every cell of our body, that the body and the eyes are one system. It's not that the eyes exist and the rest of us exists in some other world. It's all one system. So if you think about it that way, and then he threw in another little thing that said, the movement of the eyes organizes the movements of the body. And I went, what does that mean? Well, to me, knowing about networks and how they work, if you have something control something else, it means it can be an equation and it can go in the other direction. It's an electrical system. It's not a mechanical system. It's an electrical system. So you can reverse the flow, which means that if the movement of the eyes controls the movement of the body. That means every muscle. That means your toes, your hands. Then improving the way the body works as an integrated system will in some mysterious way help the eyes. And that gave me hope for the first time. So things developed and I began to understand how even to apply the information about this question of the bandwidth flowing in order to create the world we now live in. You must admit, now we live in an electronic network, basically. We shifted from a, a mechanical world to an electrical world. And electrical, wor electrical worlds are network systems. Moshe gave me the tools in order to build a internet. All you have to do is clarify the pathway of greatest information flow. In the case of AT&T, it was Wall Street. If they could make Wall Street the way they wanted it to work, then they could just spread that out all over the planet which was the model, in fact, that enabled all of this world we live in to build from. And I thought to myself, well, Feldenkrais said, in the method, we use the most conscious part of ourself to teach the unconscious parts of ourself. He didn't say which way it had to be flowing or anything else like that. And he also said, but not in the context of healing in your, my eyes, but he just said it in the course of his teaching, that the most conscious part of ourself is our hands. <coughs> you think about that for take. It's not a superficial thought, because we're going to be using that thought the whole weekend. Our hands we use for everything we do. In fact, as babies, after birth, we learn to see with our hands. We learn to see with our hands. We pick up an object with our hand, and somehow or another, in the first little while of life, we figure out how to aim our eyes toward the object. At the, in the very beginning, it could be a breast. But then it grows into other things. But always the hand leads, and the eyes feel, and the coordinates get built, literally built, in the brain that allow 
the conjunction of the hands and the eyes and the mouth in the beginning. That's what builds up our ability to see in three dimension and follow objects. I wasn't even that aware of that at the time, but basically I used my hands to teach my eyes how to see again. And I never was clear about that until many years later when I was started teaching and I realized what the common items were, but now I'm very clear about that. If, if you try and improve the eyes without realizing that the eyes are part of the whole body system, then it's not going to last because the old habits are going to pull you back to where you were before. So the basic agenda of the weekend is going to follow a four-step pathway. The first foundation to everything we're going to do is the relaxation of the central nervous system. If the central nervous system is noisy, full of confusion, full of disharmony, full of being uncomfortable, that will manifest in tension around the eyes, of the muscles around the eyes, and it will manifest because the mind will be very busy dealing with the chaos, moving, and the muscles will be a acting and, and, and unstable, which means all kinds of things that we'll discover. But basically, we need to bring quiet to the system. That's the basis of it. And that exhibits itself through anxiety also. So how do you do that? That's hard for everybody their whole life. But we're going to work on that, and mostly in the first day we're going to focus on that kind of process. So you have some tools that you'll be able to recognize, I hope, or with practice develop, that will enable you to turn your eyes into mechanisms that will bring peace to yourself, rather than the difficulties all the time. Right? Once the eyes are able to be relatively quiet, that was step one. The second thing you have to know is that vision is dependent on movement. The eyes have to move or we don't see anything. But the eyes can only move well if they can also be quiet. It's a double it's a bit, well, yin and yang, or whatever way you want to term the opposites. The eyes have to be able to be quiet, and they have to be able to move freely in all directions, depending on what is right and appropriate. Once that base is somewhat stable, the eyes have to aim in order to be able to see anything accurately, right? Say you only have one eye, which I only, I only have one functioning eye left. So, I, if I want to see that skeleton over there, I, the eye has to point there, or you're not going to see it. But if you have a lifetime of habits that make that a difficulty, then I might want to see the skeleton, but I might not be able quite to get there, and maybe I see the door handle. But I just can't find it. Well, my acuity's not going to be very good, and things will be pretty stressful. So aiming to focus is the critical next step. And then the fourth step is that because we have two eyes, that we can actually aim them to point in the same direction. That's another tricky little story. But that enables 
binocular vision and seeing where you are in space, which is critically important so that you don't walk into moving cars or whatever it is that you're doing. So those are the four things that everybody who can see well does well. And any diseases or problems sit within one of those functions, one of those activities. The doctors can, de can take care of the details within the context of the problem. But you need the overall view to, to make the whole thing complete. And that's what the, I believe the Feldenkrais method can do in a significant way that I've never found anything else that can do. And by bringing the eyes and nervous system, central nervous system, which means the brain and the, and the spine, what, what's the central nervous system? It's basically what controls the limbs and the spine. By bringing those into regular regulation kind of speed, you might say, calm, quiet, blood flows to parts of the body that were all tied up through tension. And that includes the eyes also. So by bringing, allowing blood to flow to the eyes, instead of them being frozen out of fear or whatever they're frozen from, denying the cells of the eyes blood, they begin to heal. I had incredible things happen in my eyes. I should not be here seeing. But there was fluid behind the eye and inflammation. All that stuff just eventually over time just vanished. And I'm convinced it was because the muscles of the eyes could open and the blood could flow again. The doctors do not know how to incre increase blood to the eyes. They don't know it. So they don't prescribe it. But we have muscles around the eyes and they can move and we'll move them. Learn to gain conscious control of that. I mean, you can squeeze your finger. If you hold it long enough, you're going to get blood to come to it. When you let go, it gets warm. You can do the same thing with the eyeballs. We just nobody ever told you you could do that. But babies do it all the time. They're playing with their eyes. They're rolling them around. So movement and quiet will bring healing force back to the eye. So that's basically the agenda of the weekend. It sounds very simple, and in fact it is very simple. I would like to offer you the simple truth that if you take it up persistently to get to know what's going on with your visual system, as Dr. Feldenkrais say, said, if you know what you're doing, you can do what you want. If you don't know what you're doing, you can't change anything. Okay? So, I just want to leave it like that. And we'll get into a lesson now, I think. We're going to be having a series of lessons. Can you just tell me, please, if you've never done Feldenkrais before in, in your life? You're not familiar with what the process is or what, what to do. You don't know what to, I have no idea what the heck we're going to do. Is there anybody new? Really, let me see. Don't, don't, don't hide. I'm, I'm happy you're here. It's mostly... Did I see your hand? No. Uh-huh. One, two. Okay, great. Okay, so welcome. I want to welcome you in particular. I will... I'm going to give you the simplest of instructions to, uh, if you're new, because you really learn this as you go along. But I'm going to lead you through guided movements. You're going to be on the floor. Mostly you're going to be listening to me. 
There's no point at all in looking at me during a lesson because I'm not doing what you're doing. I'm talking. There's really no point in looking at your neighbor because they don't necessarily know what the heck they're doing either. You're on your own a bit, and that's what makes it work. Because you have to think about what you're doing. It's the thinking about what you're doing that grows the neural cells in the brain. It's not watching somebody then imitating them. Because by thinking about the instruction, you have to think about it, you have to feel it, you have to sense it, and you have to move. And that's everything that the brain organizes anyway. So we're reorganizing your brain to relearn or improve how it controls the visual system as well as the whole neuromuscular system of the body. It's a different way of learning and it's not muscle. This is not an exercise class where we're trying to build your biceps. This is simply giving back the brain the information that it needs to control these systems so by default the eyes are going to improve. So if you come across any point where you're pushing, making an effort, you're actually working too hard because the nervous system doesn't learn by force. It, in fact, just shuts down, gets tight, and leaves the planet. Right? But I'll be reminding you of that as we go along. We want to be present and here and learning, and then the changes can happen. So my feeling about the whole business is that if you push to achieve something, then, for various technical reasons, there's no real improvement. Nervous system retreats under force rather than opens and learns. 